Welcome to Mormons, Mystics, and Muons, where we focus on reconstruction and recontextualization through an integration of science, psychology, consciousness, and philosophy. I'm Gabe. I'm Eldon. And yeah, so today we were going to talk about, um, I want to talk a bit about the plan of salvation. I don't know how far we'll get, um, but I was thinking about the Garden of Eden and, um, yeah, so we're maybe talk about plan of salvation, what it is in Mormonism and how that overlaps with esoteric traditions or new age, uh, philosophy and yeah, so the Garden of Eden, uh, so I think the Book of Mormon is uh, states Adam fell that men might be men are that they might have joy. Or is that the yeah second Nephi of faith? Okay, in the Book of Mormon. Um, yeah, it, it might help to just kind of back up to what the plan of salvation is from Mormon cosmology or Mormon's Mormon perspective because it's slightly different, or it's kind of a an evolution of what Catholicism kind of viewed everything as. Christ, broader Christianity and the differences of Mormon views on it in terms of the fall of Adam and Eve and uh, the Garden of Eden experience. Of course, Mormons see it as like a, um, he, uh, we're not punished for that transgression that's viewed as a transgression of, of Adam and Eve partaking of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is a spin on Christianity's kind of original sin idea. Mm. So something that Joseph Smith spells out in the articles of faith to clarify that that in, in Mormonism, we're in a fallen state, but we're not inherently evil um, because of that transgression in the garden of Eden, just something a little different than I think what uh, broader Christianity views as being original sin that we need to be cleansed from. Hence being baptized as a baby versus being baptized later in life. Uh, at least at least at least age eight when you become accountable for everything mm. in Mormonism. I remember um on my mission feeling so I mean Mormonism really focuses on like you know, where we've got the answers for where are you coming from? Um, why are you here? Where are you going? And I remember being kind of arrogant as a 19 year old kid, like, you know, I could go into somebody's home and just like give them 45 minutes and like tell them this big picture that would explain that all to them. And I think, um, I think Mormonism has, a it's got a lot more than mainstream christianity uh, but it's, it's interesting as i've learned more esoteric and like new age philosophy that the plan of salvation actually I mean, where all the parallels come from and that it's actually essentially, essentially a snapshot of like this reincarnation wheel of samsara, um, Buddhist, Hindu. I mean, it's uh, Kabbalah. You know, it borrows things. And interesting enough, like if you go into um, some of these fundamentalists, not necessarily polygamy fundamentalists, but the original people getting back to the original teachings of Joseph Smith, there's teachings uh, from him and early church leaders about uh, reincarnation or they call it multiple probation. So it's very fascinating to see it in context of that. Um, but yeah, Garden of Eden. So as you said, Mormonism, I remember thinking that Mormonism was really unique and like the only tradition that taught that the fall was a good thing, that we didn't um, blame Eve for the fall. Um, but the, yeah, in the church, the fruit 
you know, they're taught in the temple and scriptures that their eyes were opened when they took the fruit and that they would become as, you know, they were tempted saying that they were, would become as gods knowing good from evil. And so, um, it was interesting when I started learning about Gnosticism, how similar Gnostic beliefs on the fall were to Mormon beliefs. So Gnosticism is an esoteric tradition, um, uh, kind of a heretical form of Christianity after Christ and then basically got stamped out by the Catholic church killed, uh, cause they, there was this focus on gnosis or personal knowledge experience merging with the divine. And it's not a, it's not a set set of, um, beliefs or doctrines. I think that there's a, a wide range of Gnostic texts and teachings, but they kind of go around a similar theme and the Dead Sea Scrolls were Gnostic texts. Um, there were also psychedelics involved in early Gnostic sects. So there was this, um, emphasis on experiential altered states of consciousness. So, um, I copied some stuff from this one website that I wanted to read about Gnostic views. This is one take on Gnostic views or one tradition. So it said in various Gnostic Christian myths, Sophia was the catalyst who gave rise to creation in material realm. And so I think one interesting thing about esoteric traditions are instead of viewing separateness, they're viewing kind of this Russian doll situation where there's kind of this cosmos or universe God. Um, I think, um, yeah, they talk about the realm of perfection, which is pleroma. So I think that's kind of like this outer container. Sophia is one of these smaller subsets of it. So, uh, Sophia, the timeless being or Aeon who existed in the realm of perfection or the pleroma as the archetype of wisdom felt inclined to manifest creation of her own, but because she lacked the proper tool set or polarity, her creation was imperfect. And this imperfection caused an eruption in the pleroma. Sophia created Yaldabaoth or Saklas or Samuel. And I think this ends up being Yehovah or the God of the old Testament, according to, to Gnostics who is an ignorant being hell bent on crafting his own collection of inferior beings. This gave rise to the creation of the material realm, along with several princes or archons who had subsequently ruled this new realm. These ruling archons had heads of animals and were often associated with falling angels. It was no coincidence that the number of archons were correlated to our calendar. As in other religions, these material rulers were synonymous with planets, stars, and celestial bodies. Sophia's first creation Yaldabaoth was the demiurge. He was the craftsman responsible for designing and creating our universe. One intriguing implication in this matrix, pun intended, is that it solves the problem of evil because it spares the most high or God, the responsibility of our pain ridden, cancer filled or torn creation. Rather, it was Sophia and her fall from grace, which gave rise to our earthly woes. Despite her role in the eruption within the Pleroma, the Gnostics considered Sophia humanity's mother perhaps be, uh, because she is humanity's most direct correction to connection to the Pleroma. Instead of the most high God inventing Adam and Eve, it was really the Demiurge, which is why Genesis 126 has God speaking in the plural when he says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. The reason for the plural speech speech was because Yald both was speaking to his fellow archons. Detecting his malintent, Sophia delivered part of the divine spark to Eve, whose spirit was then transplanted into the tree of knowledge. And this is where it overlaps with Mormonism. The serpent brought Adam and Eve forbidden fruit, which concealed gnosis and or the divine spark. In contrast to Orthodox Judaism, the Gnostic story has the snake in the Garden of Eden as a heroic salvific figure rather than an adversary of humanity or proto Satan. Likewise, eating the fruit of knowledge was the first act of human salvation from cruel oppressive powers rather than humanity's first act of rebellion in this light. It was the God of Genesis who seems the more likely prototype for Satan. And so basically 
they've got Yahweh, who's the God of the Old Testament, who's actually this like middle manager who thinks he's in charge, creating this physical matrix. So the Gnostics believe the physical world was a prison. Uh, but Sophia was like, you know, he created the bodies. I'm going to give them this divine spark so that they can transcend this world. And so it very much aligns with Mormonism and also turns that story of on its head of like God and Satan in the garden. Yeah. I've got a lot of thoughts as you read through that and uh, thinking of parallels. So Gnosticism, if we back up just a little bit, we know mostly about Gnosticism as far as I know, because of the Dead Sea Scrolls, texts that were recovered near Egypt in the mid 20th century, basically found in a cave, kind of stumbled upon. And then I think there was more than one dig site that recovered these texts where we have almost like a closer view of what Christianity had become in, in some places. So it, apparently in the New Testament, as these Christian ideas were spreading to different parts of the world, they were kind of, as ideas do, mingling with the current ideas of where they were, the local, maybe the local gods or the local um, cultural influences. And much of the New Testament seems to be written by leaders of the church trying to contain it, trying to like unify the message, unify the narration. And Gnosticism, as I see it, maybe is like that earlier, probably closer to the ground beginnings of Christianity that was kind of stamped out. As you said, it was heretical later when the church became much more powerful and embedded with government. I think a lot of other ideas related to those early times in Christianity kind of got stamped out. Um, so in, in a weird way, it's almost like that could be truth that is being restored now as it came forth out of the ground books coming forth out of the dust that tell of, you know, closer to the action. Not that it's the truth necessarily with big capital T letter, but that it's um, that it was maybe closer to the action of when Christ's teachings were first being kind of disseminated among people. So that was one thought. Yeah, it's funny because like Mormons have, they're trying to straddle this. Um, some are trying to straddle this divide of like, yeah, there's a sealed portion. There's many great and important things. There's revelation that's going to happen. There's these other texts that we're going to get, you know, God is still speaking. Um, and yet at the same time, if things happen that way, they have to, it has to fall under the existing teachings and doctrines. Yeah. And at the other, yeah, on the other side, they also want to teach that they have the fullness of the truth. And so it, it does create this difficult. I mean, what else actually is there to be revealed if there, we already have everything. And I think Gnosticism has this, any tradition that's focused on like personal knowledge, revelation or Gnosis, um, Gnosticism, it doesn't scale very well corporate wise. And I think a lot of the reason that Gnosticism was stamped out and persecuted was the same issue that was happening in the early church with like Hiram Page and his seer stone and these other people that like, oh yeah, there can be only one. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's this difficult. Yeah. I mean, the church got excited about some of the Dead Sea Scrolls stuff and there's some really interesting things that came out of it. There's one Gnostic, the apocalypse of James that I mentioned in previous episodes where Christ is telling James basically that he's stuck in the matrix. He's going to die and he's going to meet the archons when he dies and they're going to ask him questions and he's going to have to give him certain passwords so that he can escape this matrix and very similar to the <laughs> temple. And so in some ways it looks like it confirms some of Joseph Smith stuff, but it's, it's a different enough that, um, yeah, but there's a lot of things that if it doesn't fit in the cosmology of Mormonism, isn't accepted. Yeah. And I also understand one of those Gnostic texts is the gospel of Judas, a perspective from the person who betrayed Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I was revisiting that 
that story in the New Testament earlier this week and thinking about Jesus and Judas and that relationship. And I thought that what's interesting is Jesus didn't write any of the books in the Bible. Apparently they're written by other people who were, you know, firsthand witnesses, some of them, or Mm -hmm. other people that were second or third or whatever, many years down the road. But um, assuming this Judas apostle was uh, someone who got to write their perspective, if it was closer to what they experienced, that would be interesting. Because I thought Jesus commanded Judas to betray him. This is a perspective that I kind of gleaned from this movie, Silence, which talks about Christianity in, in Japan. But I think that there's one way to view it that Jesus commanded Judas to betray him because it had to happen that way for him to get crucified. It was almost like that's part of the plan. And so Jesus chose 12 people. I think there's a spectrum there from the fully believing, jumping out of the boat, Peter, to the betrayer in Judas. And I think it represents all of the people that interact with Jesus. So there's like a spectrum that allows for everybody to interact somehow with this Jesus Christ person. He chose 12 intentionally to represent that spectrum perhaps. And so from that regard, if Judas was commanded to betray Jesus, he does so with a kiss and then Christ is crucified. Um, And then it's, it's humans who talk about what they do to Judas or what happens to him for doing that. And that he's the betrayer. He's kind of the the dark one. It's the human perspective of that. We don't actually, I don't know, of Jesus Christ's perspective of Judas. And so I think it's just kind of an interesting symbol of a spectrum of, of 12 kind of different places someone can be on that belief spectrum that can still have some value interacting with the teachings of Jesus Christ. And his idea was to unify, to bring all into one, which includes Judas. So instead of the us and them mentality, Christ unified all 12 on that spectrum as being one with him. Just a thought. Yeah, I think I haven't read. So there is the gospel of Judas and I forget when it's supposed to be from the original text, but um, I, I haven't looked too much into the story, but I think, yeah, I think the tactic or the, story re- revolves more around like Christ is commanding Judas and or Judas was doing it because he believed in Christ and was going to bring about, well, this is how Christ is mm-hmm. going to step into his role. And and, and I mean, it, I guess it's a good commentary on how people can very sincerely believe that they are doing the right thing. Um, two people can believe they're doing the right thing and be doing very opposite things, but yeah, I haven't read the yeah. uh, gospel of Judas, but, but yeah, you know, there's a wide range of Gnostic, um, beliefs. It also got me thinking about Satan in the garden of Eden. Cause he really becomes the fall guy. Cause he's there mm-hmm. and they're like, what are you doing here? And he's like, I'm just doing that, which has been done in other worlds. And so, and the whole plan couldn't go forward without Satan. And I mean, he really was the one that was telling the truth. You know, he gave him the fruit and said, you'll become yeah. as God's no good and evil. So there's two different ways that I view the um, fall, the Garden of Eden. One is... Carl Jung individuation and the other is, uh, psychedelics. So individuation like this is the story of kids that are following what their parents told them to do. Um, but their parents are products of their growing up, their limitations, their trauma that they had. And eventually they're like, screw it. Like I, I need to, I need to make my own mistakes. I need to figure things out for myself. And I'm actually never going to learn if I just do what I've been told and trust other people. Um, I actually have to experience it myself. And then they end up doing something that they were 
were always told that this is the right way. Um, and then they, through that, actually realized that that was the path that they had to do and they had to learn it themselves. And they had to often, you know, you build on what your parents taught you and you realize their limitations and how they were wrong and where you can go from there. But I mean, I, I experienced this on my mission. I was this very exactly obedient missionary. And so, you know, I was making sure we were following all the rules and like I trained several times and like was really proud that like, you know, I'm going to teach this, uh, new companion. We're going to follow the rules. And then I think without fail, every time they left me, they just did whatever they wanted to do because they never gained experience themselves of like, I'm going to do this for the right reason. I'm going to do this because I actually want to wake up at six or six 30 or, and so it was interesting. It was a learning experience for me that that's not the way. And with kids too, you, you actually have to let them make mistakes and learn for themselves. So I, I do see yeah. it as a story of ind individuation. I love that. And I, I also, I think that can go r really deep in terms of individuation Adam and Eve representing a feminine and masculine aspect and the unification of both becoming one unit in a way where each of us has a feminine and a masculine aspect, bringing those together like the yin and yang sim symbol where there's balance between those. Like a whole person is a balance of those things because those are aspects of each of us. I also think the, uh, the tree gives knowledge of good and evil or light and dark and the individuation idea is that you have a shadow. There's a part of you that's suppressed because of society or your upbringing or whatever it is that that is still a part of you, but it's suppressed and kept in a shadow. It's like a shadow part of you. And bringing to, to the unification of those, your, your shadow um, individuation is the process of acknowledging it, recognizing it, coming to terms with it and ultimately unifying those parts of you. And you only do that through partaking of this fruit, which is knowledge, which is introspection, which could also, from your other perspective, be the, the psychedelic aspect, perhaps. Yeah, it was, um, it was funny. I was looking at a, a photo of a fresco or something uh, from several centuries back. And it was Adam and Eve, and there was a mushroom in between them. I'll have to let's see if I can find it. Put it yeah, in the show I've seen but, images like that. Yeah, so that's the other aspect. I think um, Terrence McKenna, somebody texted me this last week. Talk, we were talking about the fall of Adam uh, and Eve, and I guess Terrence McKenna <laughs> called it the world's first drug bust. Um, but that's the other <laughs> aspect is that, I mean, they're taking this fruit, and in eating it, then their eyes are opened and they see things in a new way and they become as gods. And this is, you know, lines up with people's accounts of their experiences through altered states of consciousness in general, not just psychedelics. Um, and so, I mean, and it's not that it's one or the other because it's a myth. It's a story. Mm -hmm. um, and these stories can apply on different levels and different ways and can have meaning. Um, the other interesting yeah. thing, Oh, sorry. Just one more viewpoint or one more perspective on that Garden of Eden. We were among plants and animals in nature in a garden of paradise where time didn't exist before we had language, perhaps. And it's like in the beginning was the word and the word was God. It was like the, the logos. Once Adam named all everything in the Garden of Eden and it's almost like we separated ourselves. We can never go back into the animal kingdom again because we have names for everything, which is actually us just dividing things because it's all whole as one until you start dividing it up and defining this is where the tree starts. This is where the soil starts. And there's a point where the tree isn't the soil or the tree isn't the sun as soon as you mm -hmm. have those names. So the Garden of Eden also could represent our fall from eternal paradise among a... Uh, unification of all things because we started naming things. Adam was named Eve. And then that all just breaks down into further division but, ongoing. I mean, and this parallels uh, childhood development. I mean, you're born as a baby and it's a psychedelic state. I mean, you're 
just sensory input mainline to your brain. You have no constructs. Um, and I guess constructs would be defined as no names or boxes or categories. So mm -hmm. you've got sight, sound, feeling, you don't know what hunger feels like. I mean, you haven't, all of these things are foreign to you and the process of development as a baby is learning to fit things into constructs and dividing things up and recognizing, okay, this pattern of, uh, feelings don't feel good. And if I make this sort of cry, then I get something that puts that feeling away. So, you know, you develop an idea of that as hunger mm -hmm. and food. And it's funny when my kid was one, uh, I, I was reading about the attachment and child psychology and development, and he started talking and he started calling fruits. Uh, he started calling everything an apple. Like I'd give him a pear and he's like apple. And, and I was talking to my five-year-old at the time and trying to explain like, yeah, I mean, to him, it's an apple because that's his construct right now is that round things that I eat are apples <laughs> yeah. and we say it's wrong because we have this mutually agreed upon construct amongst all English speakers that mm -hmm. these are apples, but he's got his own construct. So yeah, I think the creation, the fall of Adam and Eve, I mean, the creation is organizing chaos into things and that's parallels our development as. And this is what Michael Pollan talks about in how to change your mind on psychedelics or just altered states of consciousness where you're turning off the default mode network, which is kind of the sense of self and ego and separateness and going back to the child mind where you're in these like theta brain waves and it's less, less of a construct driven naming, categorizing, seeing things as separate. And I think this also aligns lines up with, Christ talking about, you know, except you become as a little child, you can't enter into the kingdom of heaven is that, that, that is the journey that we're on. I mean, it's a crucial step to go from a baby where you're just sensing and being in the now and not thinking of a past or a future and just in the present and feeling this cloud of sensation, then you're also able to categorize and view things as objects and the subject other thing. And now we're trying to loop back and retain that ability, but also have that uh, ability to be in the moment, free, free from rumination and think of the past and future, um, and have that versatility. So, um, yeah, I like that. It's, it's, uh, the, the inner child, it's not like you could ever go back, but it's about integrating that part of you that was from the past and how you came up with who you are now, um, being in the world, but not of the world. I'm reminded of the, the matrix, which in, from some perspectives is more of a documentary <laughs> than anything. But when Neo takes the pill that unplugs him from the matrix, then he's in the belly of the Nebuchadnezzar, the ship that's in the sewer underground in hiding and they're eating gruel like looks like just slop old oatmeal or whatever that does not look appetizing. And it's that notion of like the fall, almost the fall from paradise into the fallen world. Once you see it for what it is, once you, once you see the illusion for what it is, um, there's some that want to go back kind of like cipher who mm. betrays the others in that team by going back into the matrix. He couldn't, like he, he wanted to be plugged back in. And I think there's a lot of comfort. It's like we were pulled from, and you know, the, the depiction of Neo being pu pulled out of the, the pod that he's in is much like a birth where we're so cozy, warm inside, mm -hmm. inside our mom, where everything's one. We don't know where we stop and our mom begins. And like you said, no hunger because you're just plugged right in and you're just, in that experience, you get pulled out of that when you're born, you never get to go back. And we spend much of our time, I think, unconsciously always yearning to go back. Mm -hmm. And in that way, Christ said, you must be born again. 
I think being born in the church means your mission is to get out. And for other people without religion, being born without religion, getting in is that same being born again. It's, it's all in that same kind of process. So that's where I talk about what my dad did to get into the church when he was about my age and what I did to get out, I see as the same thing because mm -hmm. of it's about that being it's a, born so, again process. Similar with my mom. I think she uh, was raised Presbyterian and I, mean, I had these questions that the church or Sunday school teachers didn't like of like predestination versus free will and whatnot. And then when she found Mormonism and the missionaries, um, yeah, it was somewhat of like a spiritual awakening for her. And she was on this like spiritual high and didn't quite understand why everybody else wasn't feeling it. Cause they, they were born into it or is, it wasn't raising them to a higher consciousness or way of thinking. But then, so for her, it was a very instrumental, important part of her life. And then for me, leaving was that same uh, elevation um, yeah. or step. The other thing about the Garden of Eden is the fig leaves and the skins, the uh, animal skins, which, you know, they, there wasn't an issue with them being naked until the shame and guilt and this feeling of being fallen mm -hmm. and needing something to cover up and kind of outsourcing their spiritual sovereignty. Yeah. Um, and so that was the perfected state actually is when, um, and a lot of things in morality, especially with like modesty, um, you actually, I mean, you're, you create the problem um, by the judgment and the shame. And I mean, you, yeah, you create the constructs of this is appropriate. This is inappropriate male bodies. It's okay to show this and females. It's not okay to show this. Mm -hmm. And so it's very, I view that, you know, Satan telling them, Hey, you know, cover up, you're naked as the shame and the guilt that is a significant programming that we have to, deprogram from and heal from in a lot of our journeys. And I, I view, I mean, the view of Christ and the atonement within Christianity versus within spirituality, um, or more new agey thought. I mean, many of those people that have left Christianity still revere or look up to Christ and it's meaningful, but instead of the atonement where he's, paying for something that you can't do yourself and you're fallen and like you're a wretch, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you'll never make it without Christ. The atonement is actually a mystical experience where he obtains oneness with everything. And the return of Christ is, you know, this return of Christ consciousness or basically the states of consciousness, the insights that he had, the oneness, you know, he commanded them to be one, even as he is with the father. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's similar, but it's this gaining your own sovereignty and this idea that instead of, I've been thinking a lot about this idea of God and Satan, um, where in religion, you know, when you think God is something separate and when you think Satan is something separate, you're outsourcing, you know, all the good things that you do. It's not really because of you. It's because of God and Holy ghost and whatnot. And then all the, mm -hmm evil things, the, the things that you judge yourself for, you know, it's not your fault. You can't take, you're not accountable for it yeah. really because it's, you know, it's Satan. And so this yeah. growth and Jung's shadow work and stuff is realizing that God and Satan are within you. It's this dark in the shadow and um, integrating that and taking ownership and having that sovereignty. Yeah. I mean, I thought I used to think, Oh, you know, I'm so glad that I'm, a Mormon. Cause if I would, and I'd be like, you know, doing all these addictive behaviors, I drink, I would do this and that. And then I left Mormonism and I didn't do those things. And I realized like, Oh, it's, it actually wasn't Mormonism. Like I'm inherently an ethical and moral person. And I want to 
love and care and connecting right. people. And it wasn't Mormonism. And in fact, in a lot of ways that held me back the guilt and the shame and the, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I got a lot of thoughts about that. The, um, that's interesting. You were thinking of that this week. I was also, I was reflecting on Jesus time in the desert and 40 days fasting in the desert and thought that if, from one perspective, Satan isn't separate. It was Jesus the whole time, just him. It was him with his shadow, Satan representing kind of his shadow confronting that. Mm -hmm. He's got all of this charisma. He's got all of this communicative power. And he's got an upbringing that exposed him to a lot of ideas that probably a lot of his local communities didn't have. He'd spent time in Egypt, which seems to be a theme for ancient ideas uh, kind of coalescing. We know he's visited by wise men from the East. Perhaps there were Zoroastrian people who gave him this idea of a duality of, of a, a, go a God and a devil kind of in opposition of each other. And he spent time, um, he, of course, he had his Judaism background. And then, in, and then the idea of the Romans were kind of all around with this polytheistic view. So Jesus was kind of in a cultural melting pot, or at least seems like he had exposure to ideas. So then in the desert, I'm thinking, what if he's, he's kind of reconciling who he is inside, what he's capable of? Could he use his powers for good or evil in this world? And it was his individuation process of like, I'm ultimately going to be someone who submits. I'm ultimately going to be someone who um, votes for love, like in every case or as many cases as I can as the option, as the best option. And overcoming those temptations of Christ or of Satan was him like, I'm not going to use these powers for evil for myself um, to just get a lot of food or a lot of mm -hmm. attention or, th you know, those three temptations kind of summarized. Yeah. I mean, I think I viewed that as well uh, in my journey of realizing, oh, these are just confronting his shadow self. These yeah. are the urge of like seeking um, praise and a mastery of your body of like, uh, I'm hungry and can I mm -hmm. have self mastery and kind of deconstruct and, um, overcome that. But yeah, Satan was him. I mean, it was inside of him. Yeah. There's so. a line from Alexander Solzis, Solz and Nitsen. I don't know how to say his name really well, but the line separating good and evil passes not through States nor between classes nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart. And through all human hearts, this line shifts inside us. It oscillates with the years and even within hearts overwhelmed by evil, one small bridgehood of good is retained. And I think that kind of summarizes what uh, we're talking about with shadow and integration and uh, kind of unifying all the aspects of ourselves, not projecting it out there, mm -hmm. not putting Satan out there, not putting God out there, but keeping it all inside because there is a universe outside, but I also think there's an entire universe inside with our unconscious that we can't really plumb the depths of. Yeah. And I think this is, um, once you bring it and you realize it's inside of yourself, you realize that you are, you have the, all things good come from within you and the things that you judge and, uh, attribute to Satan actually a part of you too. And it's okay. Like these are forces that we all have and it's not about casting those out and repressing. I mean, therapy doesn't work when you just still judge yourself as like, Oh, that, that part yeah. needs to be cast out. It's actually accepting doing the part work and understanding, Oh, why do I feel this way? What is this temptation is, you know, this is normal. How can I integrate it in, um, with, uh, light in me? Uh, so yeah, I, I'm excited to do more episodes and get yeah. through the rest of the plan of salvation. Um, there's a lot here, um, Definitely. about more, multiple probations will be interesting. So, but we'll wrap it up at that. Uh, thanks for listening. We you can reach out and let us know your thoughts at Mormons, mystics, and muons at gmail.com. And we'll come back at you again in the future with the rest of the plan of salvation. Thanks.